Hi, friend. Ted C. Yuba here, author of The New Think and Grow Rich. And not coincidentally, I'm also the author of and the reader of or the lector of The New Think and Grow Rich audio version, which is the primary point I want to talk to you about right now. First of all, I mean, let's talk about The New Think and Grow Rich. You obviously know it's built straight on the sturdy foundation of Napoleon Hill's success classic, Think and Grow Rich. It's hailed as the book that launched a million millionaires. It's known as the book that sold a hundred million copies. Every sales organization, MLM, training, insurance, real estate, everybody who has to depend on being up is prescribed and most of them have read. Although I say most of them because well, there were some problems. Which leads me straight into what gave me, little old Ted C. Yuba, the audacity to believe that I could update a success classic. I mean, I have to tell you, the first time I thought about it, man, I headed for the cover. I couldn't even think of it. And then I, I, I got up back from underneath the desk where I had dove when the thought just occurred to me and said, no, I can never do that. That's like some fruit from California announcing he's rewritten the Holy Bible and made it better, I might add. Well, after some time, events, and circumstances, the more of which there's other stories told in other places, I came to realize that not only could I and should I, but I must update that classic and bring it into the modern age. Now, my experience in Fast Forward was that I was teaching this th internationally and not everybody really went down well with the antiquated language. You know, Americans, the Brits, we have English as our background language. We could understand the antiquated language. A lot of people, a lot of people are recent acquisitioners of the English language. Couldn't understand it. It is antiquated language. It was written in an epic almost a hundred years ago. None of the characters are alive, which some of the people other nations didn't really connect with. Americans could go with it. Americans weren't the issue, the biggest issue. Although I've had a lot of people thank me for clarifying it, for including women, for including blacks. And that's basically, in a nutshell, where we began. We said, man, look, this book as it reads today, not, and it was written in a different time, this is not a put down, not in any stretch, but it was written in a time and it came across as, in today's language, racist, sexist, nationalist. You had to be white, American, male, to be of any count at all in the book. Man, there, was, there were a couple gratuitous stories thrown in, a couple paragraphs here, a couple paragraphs there about some women, but they also were white. And most of the examples, three out of four, or is it two out of four, got their money by marrying it. In other words, it just didn't represent. So we had to, this is what I call editing, we had to bring it in to the modern age in editing. So now we have examples, stories, incidents, quotes from different people all across the globe different nationalities, different sexes, different races, different periods of time. Hey, we quote Lao Tzu and Confucius. If you're from the East, you'll understand those, of course, but they're ancient, whether you know it or not, in the West. <laughs> and, but, you know, the biggest issue, that was editing. The biggest issue was, well, let me ask you this. If you had a critical care situation in your family, now cancel, cancel, but if you had for imagination purposes and money was no issue, 
Would you want to go into a decrepit, run-down, disease-ridden, third-world hospital? Or would you prefer to go to something that was antiseptic, clean, with all the modern technology? Think it, well, listen, almost 100 years ago, all medicine was in a pretty dismal shape compared to what it is today. There's been progress in medicine. How about flying? Well, we were just a couple of decades away from putting metal on airplanes whenever this book was written. Now we're flying interstellar missions. We're flying hundreds of people across the great expanse of the Pacific Ocean. Wasn't done then. Remember the silent movies? Everybody moved fast. <laughs> That's what was happening when Think and Grow Rich came out. There had been, now let's step out of sight. You know, there had been no Milton Erickson. There had been no neuro-linguistic programming. And even there had been no Tony Robbins. On the face of self-improvement, personal development, human potential, I think there's been some changes too. Or is human potential, personal achievement, the only science, the only technology that has not progressed dramatically in the intervening almost 100 years? Would you like to drive the same kind of cars? Airplanes, medical care, <laughs> headphones, or a dream? <coughs> Remember those pictures of people, all the household gathering around, a, actually most of them were drawing, gathering around the family radio on Saturday night. That's when the original Think and Grow Rich was written. I think you catch my drift. We kept all 13 principles, renamed three of them. Auto-suggestion, remember, <laughs> the, quantum science did not exist. When the book was coming out, Rhine at Duke University was just so new. Today we have programming instead of only auto-suggestion, chapter three. Today, instead of tickling everybody's fancy with the mystery of sex transmutation, always got a laugh, which actually it's accurate though, but it's called passion. And the 13th principle, which Napoleon called the sixth sense, and actually described differently, and, and that's a very important part of it, of what we call Holo magic. But the, the principles are the same. It needed new dress, it needed new sensitivities, and it needed to incorporate and reflect the updating that we've had in persuasion, in business, in communication, in the subconscious mind and the effects it has. So that's what we put in the new Think and Grow Rich. Particularly, I want to talk about what makes the audio version so unique, so much better than the written version. Well, it is the written version read, read by yours truly, the author, which you probably couldn't find a better person to read, and there will be others who read it in the future, but hey, here's the whole deal. It's all related to learning styles. Learning styles. Number one, it's just hard to read. It's just hard to read. If you look at the pages of a book, you see a bunch of squigglies, squiggles and lines at the line. If, if these books. And if some books go down and some books go right to left, but it doesn't matter, man. How would you like to be reading Chinese or hieroglyphics? Well, symbols are the same thing. It takes a lot of beta processing to work it. Whereas when we understand, boom, with conversation, with talking, we have been communicating as a race with sounds and words, Cro-Magnon Man, for hundreds of thousands of years. Writing is a very recent invention, very recent in the, in the expanse of humanity. 
very much more recent in European persons and very much, much, much more recent in Americans. To be able to read is a miracle. But it takes a lot of work. And that work can put you out of the place where you might like it. A couple cases in point. Have you ever, like me, <laughs> man, hey listen, I've got four language degrees, three of them advanced, and I've got other stuff like certified hypnotherapy that relates to language, NLP. I understand language very well. Like me, have you ever read a page, a paragraph, a sentence? Have you ever read something and realized that you didn't get it at all? You read it, but you didn't get it. You had to go back and reread it again and work to get... Well, that's just not the place of mind that's going to get into programming. So we understand things better. By the way, I speak Spanish fluently. Absolutely. I, I bought and sold cars, houses, uh, worked on jobs, communicated... Absolutely, there is no question about my fluency level. On the other hand, I picked that up as a second language. Please don't ask me to read or write. Those are, those are chores, and I can't get it right, and I'm always second-guessing, and it's hard, and I have to figure out what they mean. I don't have these convers I don't have these issues when we're conversing. We always make it. And if there is a, a detour, well, we can solve it. Writing is tough to get, bottom line. Not only that, a lot of people just, they say 35% of the population just cannot get what they need to get out of books. Now I know that you may have an education that was tainted with the old book and the IQ and the take test philosophy, but recent education is moving more and more towards experiential education on the job training. Do what people want, get them involved. And it's, it's, a book is a hard job. But basically, it's the ability to understand. When you and I are talking one another, we understand. When I write something, when I write something, when I write something, it, See, every single one of those says something different. That comes across in spoken language. It doesn't come across in written language. And I'm going to give you an example that I used from my professor days at California State University. I, I would have struggles with this, right, with 18, 19, 21-year-old kids coming in, and uh, young adults, excuse me. And, and they wouldn't believe me when I would tell them that written language could be so easily misunderstood and a spoken language could be clearly understood using the identical words. Now this is another one of those cancel cancel situations, identical words. I didn't say John shot his wife. It means what it means, I didn't say John shot his wife. On the other hand, I didn't say John shot his wife. Now I'm going to emphasize just a different word. This is all I'm doing. I didn't say John shot his wife. 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 You see, every single one of those means something different from, I didn't say John shot his wife. You know, he must have shot someone else. To, I didn't say John shot his wife. I mean, he may have kamaloped her and all that. Enough for the understanding lesson, cancel, cancel, since we want peace and tranquility in all the world, and especially for the revered feminine race. But you catch my point. And that's what you get. That in the bottom line essential is what you get when you take hold of, you grab hold, you engage yourself 
with the new Think and Grow Rich audio version. Sure, it's more convenient, it's portable, you put it on your iPod, but we're talking about meaning. We're talking about the meaning that was put in there. You catch the author's inflections, emphasis, tonality. You know if he's serious? Ha, you know if he's joking and gay? You know if this is something that we should consider? Or if this is something we are ridiculing? Understanding meaning. If you're going to invest in improving yourself, if you're going to spend time reaching for more, following the path that others who have already done it recommend to you, doesn't it make sense to grab hold of the audio version? It's the written version why the original Think and Grow Rich is known as the book that launched a million millionaires. You know, that sounds phenomenal. And the fact that it was recognized and adopted in the sales training world is phenomenal. And it's been phenomenal. But when you combine that million millionaires with that 100 million sold, you've got a 99% failure rate on the success and effectiveness of the book, the original Think and Grow Rich, as fame holds it. The same stats kind of are holding for the new Think and Grow Rich, too. Because reading is a difficult chore. Take it in to audio, my friend, and feel it. And let me know how much you love this audio version. Go comment on my blog, holomagic.com forward slash blog.